Oh, we're being recorded. Um, so thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alejandra, Aaron, and uh, for for the invitation. I'd like to extend the uh, the uh, thank yous to to your team, to Aaron in particular, with whom I've been uh, corresponding for quite a while already, and uh, to my fellow panelists, Keina, Minerva, and uh, Nicolas, and thanks to everyone who's attending this uh, talk tonight or uh, afternoon hours in, at uh, your place. I guess we have a kind of a, a rather big window of time difference. Um, so art and economy, how is economy determined by um, the economic system? I would like to make a, a, little, um, uh, a little detour historically um, to think before we get to the second question you asked, um, what, what, what alternatives we have. And, and I'd like to make a small historical detour to think um, where the idea of autonomy of art uh, comes from, right? Uh, we, if we speak about determination of art through economy, then I think it's, um, it's uh, pertinent. We, we ask ourselves where the idea of an autonomy would come from, which, you know, Autonomy, I guess that for most people would mean that it is not determined by anything, right? So um, this idea that art would be autonomous comes from, from the 18th century, more specifically, it's part of an ideology that gave shape to the process of emancipation of the central European bourgeoisie in the 18th century, um, that uh, together with the age of reason, with enlightenment, uh, constructed art as a field per se of, um, of uh, training of new judgment, uh, forms of judgment and new forms of, of value, like moral value for this bourgeoisie and process of emancipation, which ultimately led to the big uh, uh, bourgeois revolutions in Central Europe. Um, so where does this idea of autonomy come from? It's, it's basically uh, very simple and the idea of autonomy that uh, was given by, by this uh, bourgeoisie and process of emancipation actually means uh, that art would be autonomous, not from the market, we, would, uh, uh, we will come uh, back to that, but it first of all would be autonomous from uh, the church and the crown, right? The church and the crown were the two, let's say leading forces in uh, the centuries previous to the so-called age of reason and the emancipation of the bourgeoisie. So um, the church and the crown, let's say royalty and, and, um, and, and the church uh, were the, the main sponsors of art. The, they were the ones who would commission art. They were the ones uh, who would, in, in the European context, of course, they, they were the ones who would pay for art. And the bourgeoisie in process of emancipation who wanted to emancipate from the influence and the determinations uh, prescribed by uh, or, or um, imposed by the church and the crown, um, the, the bourgeoisie felt the need to be autonomous from them in order to emancipate as a society. So the idea of autonomy in that sense is actually the absolute contrary of the idea of an autonomy from the market. But um, the, the autonomy of art is constructed around the commodification of art and the liberal ideology that the market would be a democratic and a free space, right? So art as a commodity is quintessential um, for the ideological constitution of art as an autonomous sphere. Um, so the idea is that, that actually the market would provide that autonomy, right? So the middle European 18th century bourgeoisie and process of emancipation uh, worshiped the freedom of, of the market just as much as the freedom of expression or the freedom of uh, interpretation of art. Um, so um, that should, should give us to think, right? What, what, um, what does that mean if we speak of autonomy and determination of art? I think it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, um, art, as uh, you, you all you know, are art professionals in, in one way or the other, um, we know that what, what gives shape to the art system is the economic system. And we know that um, uh, where there's money, um, there's uh, 
well, how should I say it? There's two different sorts of art in a way, right? There's, there's uh, um, uh, art that is dealt with largely in the, in the market and there are institutions that control the value of uh, uh, artworks as commodities. And then there's, let's say, like a, a discursive art or a, a format that is more um, like a biennial art format or so, something that is rather um, uh, of a dis discursive nature and very often is also produced in a way that it uh, refuses uh, its uh, process of commodification. Let's say uh, uh, unsellable works, right? Uh, ephemeral works, uh, works that are very difficult to assimilate by uh, the, the, the regular uh, commodification pattern and market structures. But still it is uh, necessary to understand that for example, as a, uh, a professional, um, um, let's say a, a director of a museum who has a large collection will always earn more than a director of, a, uh, of an art institution that is a, a think tank, right? Because um, uh, the, the museum that has a large collection has a huge influence on market value of works they um, collect or that they show. So if a, if a, if a museum with a large collection starts, uh, uh, does a, a solo show of a, a young upcoming emerging artist and uh, and buy some of these works into the collection, then the market value rate, rate rises, right, of these. Uh, at the same time, uh, we should not underestimate the symbolic value of uh, biennials, which also can contribute to the increase of value of artworks. For example, an artist participating in Documenta uh, will ra raise the value of, of the artworks of this artist if, if this artist produces artworks that are sellable. So, um, I think we cannot, um, and it is a historical construction as I just uh, pointed out, we cannot um, uh, uh, underestimate the, the determination of the market for art, even as an autonomous and free form of expression, right? This is linked, it is inseparable. But that also means that this should give us to think that as long as the market is the regulator of the freedom of expression, the social inequality in, in our societies will, will prevail. And uh, uh, speaking here with uh, uh, Minerva Okeina, um, who, who, you know, or in Bolivia, we, we know um, the, the inequality, social inequality is, is huge and, and the unbalance, the disbalance between those who have and those who don't is huge. And we also know that uh, creative, the creative force let's say of humans does not reduce itself to people who, who benefit from the market and its regulations. So people who are outside of the market, um, uh, they, they will not encounter uh, a safe space in the market, right? So um, if the social inequality in our societies prevails with uh, the market as a regulator of freedom of expression and of autonomy, then um, it will constitute a safe space only for those who are the winners of the struggles and the crises of the market. And we know how those are in the capitalist system. So, um, so far to, to the small input to, to the first question, how um, does the market uh, uh, or, or the, the economy determine um, the, uh, the art? Um, and if we think about alternative models, I, I would say uh, in, a, in, a very general, in, in a very general take that we have to see what sort of alternative models are possible in different contexts. So um, a, an alternative in Bolivia might be quite different from an alternative in uh, uh, Brazil, in Mexico, in the US. So um, I think we have to be very um, specific of, of, the, of the local circumstances and condition if we want to think of uh, alternative uh, models. I would say speaking within the idea of a modern state, um, an alternative to the market as regulator would be that in countries with such a huge uh, social inequality as we have it in, in the Latin American context, for example, um, the state could actually operate as a sort of um, uh, uh, amortiguación, amortiguador. Um, it's uh, like a. Please help me. 
Um, well, it's just, as a buffer, as a buffer zone or so for for the social inequality, and the um, the state could provide or try to provide institutions or gallery spaces, educational institutions that may um, uh, 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 create actually democratic spaces of equality and not um, uh, uh, make uh, the spaces of inequality, which the market is by definition, um, I, I think, um, uh, more severe, right? So in, in, in terms of, of the idea of a modern social state, um, the, uh, the state itself could provide, this would be a real alternative, right? If we think about, you know, public art, public art spaces in which equality and the de-editization, this elitization, like the, the lowering of, of, of the elitist factor that uh, uh, visual arts unfortunately do have, um, so that we can create actually safe spaces for those who, do, who are not the winners of the market and who, are, who do not benefit from the rules uh, of the market. So this is speaking from a very general idea of a modern state form and what uh, the state could do. Um, uh, I, well, the Mexican context is, is, a, is a crucial, I think, uh, a place to think about the democratization of art in, in a way what, what the Russians had as, as, a, as, a, as a revolution, art in the Russian revolution, the Mexican had with the Mexican revolution. And one might think what uh, uh, you want about um, the muralists as persons, but the famous uh, uh, Mexican muralists did implement a, um, um, an innovation that is the idea of democratization of art bringing art to the public and understanding art as a public common um, that I think is crucial for what has developed uh, afterwards uh, in the Latin American, uh, Latin American context. In the Brazilian context also, after um, the Second World War, there was a, a big uh, increment of uh, understanding uh, modern art as, as a democratic uh, uh, common, uh, whatever one might you know, think of it uh, in particular and in specificities, there are still um, uh, uh, huge um, inequalities, uh, both in Mexico and in Brazil. It's, it was not you know, resolved or so, but there were historical moments in which um, uh, there was a shift of thinking of what art could be and it be considered uh, a kind of state-funded public uh, common. And uh, so this, this would be one side. On the other hand, we have, I think, as an alternate model, we should think in countries like Bolivia. Bolivia is a, a plurinational state since 2009, we are a, a country who in our constitution of the year 2009 um, acknowledges 36 originary indigenous peasant and Afro-diasporic uh, nations, 36 equal nations. All these 36 nations have um, a different, um, let's say approaches of uh, of producing, of living together, of societies, languages, and also of production of what common goods are, right? So, so um, private property is anyway quite a, a modern and Euro-centered um, idea. So um, in these 36 nations in Bolivia, to take one specific example of an alternative, we could think about how, um, uh, a common good, a cultural expression is produced collectively on, on the basis of a communitarian uh, knowledge and the basis of uh, uh, an ancestral knowledge that allows um, a, a cultural expression to be shared and to be a common good per se, and not a, an object that belongs to someone. In that sense, um, we, I think, who uh, come from countries who, who are, are built on uh, the lands of, um, and this includes all of us, who are built on the lands of uh, originary nations who have a, a different understanding of, of property, of value, and of commons. Uh, we could, I think, learn a lot in terms of alternate models by um, learning um, how to construct something out of a, a collective process and do not um, uh, create spaces in which uh, value is a benefit for a few 
and uh, a loss uh, for the majority. That was my input. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Minerva, are you ready? Hey, Max, thank you for that very useful introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, I'll be kind of brief answering the two main questions. Um, I think, as I see it, art in itself is not determined by the capitalist system, but the logics of the art market are. And I think it's the same situation for the institutional cultural life that has a lot of pressure. It also means pressure on artists to generate particular models of production and even uh, formal solutions recognizable, uh, even as, as brands, no? um, or linked to very specific issues or concept, conceptual influences, if, if that might have a market. So I wasn't planning to, to show any uh, slides, but I will <laughs> at the end. Because uh, I want to talk about a, a project I did for the Whitechapel um, Gallery. And it was uh, at the time when their main building was on the restoration. Let's see. Uh, there you have it. So they decided to uh, rent a shop in the Petticoat line, uh, Lane um, area. It's a very popular market. In fact, it's the first uh, market in uh, London. So this is a, a very old image of how the market looked like, and it looks very much the same nowadays. So they invited artists to produce very specific projects for um, the community of the East of London. And uh, what I did was uh, generate this kind of currency for the traders of the market. And um, well, the idea was to also plan a system so the currency could end up also supporting all the traders of the market. Um, at the end, the name of the coin uh, was uh, Scoop because it was very much inspired by, by the cooperative uh, models of the East of London in the around 1920, when the uh, cooperative system was very much part of all social life. Uh, it was uh, linked not only to the regular consumption like supermarkets, but um, uh, musicians were part of cooperatives um, women's organizations had uh, thousands of members. Uh, it was a very different atmosphere, uh, social atmosphere. So this is the design I ended up um, using. Bread and honey is part of slang of that part of uh, London as well. And one of my uh, main references in Mexican history is um, Ricardo Flores Magón. He um, was an anarchist, uh, very much linked to the, um, also the rural communities, not um, uh, totally dedicated to the urban life, uh, but also paying attention to the rural areas in Mexico. So, uh, they were very much uh, an anarchist movement, pre-revolutionary. And um, uh, this is a quote by him, the right to rebellion is sacred. And I'm also using a graphic by Rini Templeton. And she was part of many uh, social movements in Mexico as a graphic designer. So all her production was around um, uh, social movements. And uh, that ended up being um, uh, not that specific at the end because it got uh, reused by many uh, contemporary movements as well. No? So it had a, um, let's say, second life, all this um, production of, of graphics. So what I did to distribute this um, currency was to 
uh, give it to the traders of the market and they could use it either as a change instead of a British pound or they could exchange uh, any other currency for the coin. And the thing is, I open as well uh, an ice cream parlor in the shop that um, the Whitechapel had rented. And what we had there was a lot of documentation on the cooperative system of the 20s and um, leaflets, uh, images about all these uh, women's movements, uh, examples of tokens, which were the um, initial um, inspiration for, for the scoop uh, coin. And um, they were uh, tokens, but they were very direct in um, some way. You know? they, they would say a pint of uh, milk or a loaf of bread. Uh, so you immediately have the image of um, what you were exchanging uh, the tokens for. And that also connected uh, as part of my research to something that um, uh, happened in Mexico with um, currency created by the Henneken Haciendas in Yucatan. Um, there was a period in uh, Mexican history that is linked to slavery. And these haciendas producing henneken, which is uh, fiber coming from the, uh, the agave, the cactus plants. Uh, it was the main product for um, export uh, around that time because of the war. I mean, they were using it to um, uh, produce the sacks for, for grains that were exported in war times. So it also linked to, to that kind of uh, currency. So uh, wanting to create this new currency, well, I had to generate also um, what this currency could be um, exchanged for. So people could only buy ice cream with the, with the scoop. And uh, what happened was that, um, well, it was called monochrome because we only had like one uh, color, no color additives as part of the, the shop, but different flavors. So the community was mainly the one going there and uh, buying also the, the ice cream. But uh, it was very interesting that uh, at some point, even someone from the market got paid in, in scoops because he was helping the, the traders of the market just to gather um, cardboard and, and just as a general helper. But he liked so much to go there with his brother and have a fight or uh, just sit there and chat that he really wanted to get the scoops. And, and then he was working to uh, be paid as um, well in scoops. And well, there you can see uh, the opening of the shop, a little bit more about the cooperative systems and even a bank system that would um, uh, also receive and exchange the uh, scoop currency. So that was the um, series of slides I wanted to, to show you just to have this information as a background. Uh, with the regards to the other question, I think um, we have many examples of uh, how communities have been resisting, um, well, the economic impact of the capitalist system. Uh, and in fact, just, I think any human activity that generates a community already opposes uh, capitalism, that is all the time looking for um, isolating or uh, individualizing. And um, uh, for me, a big uh, reference would be the Zapatistas communities that everywhere I go are also a reference uh, for other social movements. If I go, for example, to, to Germany, to the uh, 
uh, Hambacher Forest, where they are defending a little bit of forest from the mining industry, um, they would have the, the Zapatistas as a big reference. So their influence has been uh, very big and uh, they are not the only example. And there are other um, uh, little examples or, or communities, I think uh, also very much linked to um, ecology um, that can be a, a reference in that kind of situation. Also, um, a modern co cooperatives uh, that have uh, developed their own currencies in Mexico. Um, I've seen at least five uh, main projects developing their own currencies. So that could be also part of the the examples, but um, there are many more. I think even, um, well, it might be a little bit controversial, but uh, if we end up talking about cryptocurrencies and how they are now uh, being related to the production of digital art, that's another interesting example, even though it's not um, apart from the logics of capitalism, it's interesting how they want to somehow um, validate um, an exchange system apart from the, the usual uh, banking system. Uh, and well, I would like to talk also about um, the concept of temporary autonomous zones that also links to uh, the Zapatistas. Uh, in general, I think, yeah, making community, but also making trouble could be a, a good concept to explore. Um, one of my also main references is uh, Lucio Urtubia. Uh, he was a Spanish anarchist that at some point uh, managed to uh, forge uh, traveler's checks and put in, in um, big trouble uh, the banks almost by himself uh, sorry that's my dog she's playing around <laughs> and uh, she has a very noisy toy i'm sorry but i'll, I'll finish here uh, we can continue with the discussion a little bit later thank you thank you thank you okay Nicholas, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Everyone can hear me? Great. Um, so thanks for those two, uh, two great talks. I'm not going to, um, because of time, draw explicit um, connections between them, but you'll hear them, uh, particularly the maxes, and, and maybe they'll, they'll come up later. So in the very short time I have, uh, I want to try to say three things. Um, one easy thing, one uh, hard thing, and one historical thing. Um, and I'll, I'll try to squeeze them all in as best as I can. Um, so uh, obviously the easy one first. Um, so the questions we're asked today uh, has already been referenced. Um, in what ways is art determined by the current economic system and what are alternative models? Uh, those two questions obviously go together. If we're looking at a kind of deterministic relationship, um, we're obviously want to get out of that relationship in, so in some way. Um, and the first question, in what, way, in what ways is art determined by the current economic system? is a properly materialist question. And whether it's meant to be read that way or not, although the more I hear, the more I think it is, um, I take it to be a fundamentally Marxist in inspiration. And the origins of modern materialism, Marxist materialism, as opposed to an older sort of uh, 18th century materialism, um, in the Marxist sense, is the, is the German ideology, Marx's um, critique of uh, his contemporaries, uh, the young Hegelians, uh, which is kind of a complicated story. It's kind of a complicated text. But there, the sort of central premise um, is, uh, uh, comes early on, uh, life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. That's sort of fundamental intervention that Marx is making, uh, or a sort of fundamental disagreement with the, um, with the, with the young Hegelians. In other words, not, uh, not the idea that um, the consciousness is somewhere, somehow its own prime mover, but that consciousness is conditioned by, by history, by, by social conditions, and by the economy. So that seems pretty straightforward and pretty, um, for most of us, I imagine, uh, not most of us in general, but in this room, I imagine, uncontroversial. Um, but in fact, it's a response, as I mentioned, to the German idealist tradition for which 
consciousness was understood as absolute. And the German word for that is unbedingt, uh, das unbedingte, which could just as easily be translated, and sometimes it's translated, as the unconditioned. So what is at stake in, in, in Marx's overturning of, of the, or disagreement with the young Hegelians is not really a question of causality, of one thing causing another, of the economy causing or directly determining um, consciousness or art, as we would have it, but rather one of boundary conditions. Um, so where Marx's translators to English almost always use determine uh, to translate a whole variety of, of words, not just uh, uh, Bedingen, um, we're better off reading uh, condition. Uh, but then, if we think of the relationship between the economy and art as one of conditioning, as producing sort of boundary conditions, as Minerva mentioned, uh, producing the art market, uh, in which uh, artists one way or another have to make their way, um, then the question looks a little bit different, because if art is conditioned everywhere by the current economic system, the question is not how art can escape, but what we can do about it. So that's the sort of easy one, is sort of, rather than thinking about determine, um, which produces a whole set of paradoxes um, that are really sort of unnecessary. Um, we don't need that set of relationships to be good materialists. Um, the word condition or the concept of conditioning um, works better and without producing those paradoxes, as I, as I hope you'll see. Um, so the second thing is the harder thing, uh, and that has to do with the fact that the relationship between art and the market uh, or art and the economic system is in an important regard a normative matter, not an empirical one. Um, that is, artworks are commodities. It is, uh, that is an empirical matter. Um, and in that sense, um, alternative models uh, are not on the table I mean, in the sense that they might exist here and there, but they're not about to sort of uh, replace or supplant or um, equal in significance the art market. But the question is, why does this pose a problem for art? In other words, um, we don't worry about the commodification of coffee mugs, um, or we might, or we should. Um, but not in the same way. In other words, um, we worry about labor conditions, we worry about the environment, we worry about all kinds of, all kinds of things appropriately, um, but we don't worry that um, somehow the being or the proper um, social existence of, of coffee mugs is threatened by their commodity character in the way that we worry about the work of art uh, being threatened by its commodity character. So um, one of the claims, one of Marx's claims in the Grundrisse but, but elsewhere, uh, is that capitalism involves the conversion of the metabolism of human existence, of human intercourse, uh, into a gigantic market. Markets involve a peculiar form of, of normativity, and this is sort of something that Marx is really sort of clear about, but he doesn't originate it. It comes from Adam Smith, um, which is that uh, market normativity is devoid of normative judgments. That is, markets involve a kind of normativity, uh, commodify, a commodity is ratified, as having a social um, social use when it's bought, uh, and only when it's bought, but the market doesn't care uh, why it is bought or have anything to say about with uh, say with regard to its value outside of its exchange value. In other words, the fact that it was bought and sold. This is precisely what Adam Smith meant by the invisible hand, which allocates uh, resources without requiring social judgments. But this poses a problem for art because artworks solicit normative judgments. In other words, we argue about the meaning of a work of art constantly. We uh, debate the importance of a given artwork. Um, we put them in a museum or we don't, uh, and so on and so forth. We buy them, purchase them for the museum or not, and so on and so forth. So if artworks are understood to be created for a market, those disagreements suddenly disappear. Who cares what it means? Uh, what matters is what it meant to the buyer. In other words, the kind of normativity that matters when something is shown in the market is a different kind of normativity than I think what Max was calling discursive when we have no choice but to argue about, about the value or the importance of, give, of, of different artworks. But of course, the moment that, that, uh, that, that, um, that those disagreements disappear, their value, the artworks value as artworks disappears. In other words, the only value they have left is their value uh, as, uh, as commodities. So in other words, what is created for the market is created for someone to buy it, and what other people think about it uh, doesn't matter. In other words, its value as an artwork doesn't matter. So that's why commodification seems like a unique kind of problem when it comes to artworks. Uh, their very being as artworks, as objects that solicit normative judgments, seem to disappear. But you'll see, and this is the tricky part, that this is not an empirical matter, but a matter of normative presuppositions, uh, although those presuppositions depend on normative, on, on empirical conditions. In other words, you can't tell simply by looking at something uh, whether it was made for a market or made to be understand, understood as art. So the economic conditions under which an artwork is produced matter not directly as, determinant, as determinants of the, of the artwork, 
but because they affect how we approach the artwork itself. Uh, in other words, it is when art is normatively presupposed to be merely commodity, and that, of course, is one version of the, of the neoliberal uh, agenda, is to understand everything as, as merely a commodity, and if not, it should be. Um, uh, but it is only under those conditions, which actually are not historically new, I'll get to that in a moment, uh, that its, historic, its empirical status as a commodity becomes a problem. So this is what's at stake for us uh, in the sort of postmodern, um, literally postmodern period, uh, in the problem of uh, the commodification of art. So this brings me to the third historical point, and I'll um, I'll pick up almost exactly where uh, Max left off, um, sort of in the 18, 1830s, more or less, with uh, with Balzac, um, but not in any sort of detailed way. So. Um, our understanding of the commodification of art in the second half of the 20th century and, and, and in the first half of the, of the 21st is heavily influenced by thinkers like Adorno, like Clement Greenberg, who came of age during the modernist period and took the modernist situation uh, to be normal. But the modernist period was profoundly abnormal. And this is the great insight of Pierre Bourdieu, who showed that the artistic autonomy, that uh, artists of, uh, uh, that the sort of ideology of autonomy produced in the modernist period um, was not the natural condition of art as it was taken to be by, particularly by Adorno, um, but was rather brought about by artist struggles uh, to create autonomous institutions outside the market. Uh, so the period that preceded modernism uh, in, in literature that was literary impressionism, but there are different words for it in different national and, and, um, and uh, different national and, uh, and artistic contexts. Um, but let's say the last half, the second half of the 19th century, looked uh, in many ways a lot like our own. And if you're sort of skeptical about that, um, I mentioned Balzac earlier. If you read uh, Lost Illusions, uh, it feels uh, tremendously uh, contemporary. Artists were increasingly concerned about the threat the market posed for their art's existence as art uh, and devised numerous and ingenious ways to negate within the work of art, art itself the presupp presupposition that was produced for the market, which of course it also undoubtedly and necessarily was. That was the very sort of boundary condition that they were concerned about. So this brings us finally uh, to the second question, uh, briefly, um, uh, about alternative models. Uh, and of course, on a long view, as I think um, maybe Max and Minerva both said, and I would agree, I'm not remembering exactly where it came up, um, on the long view, the question of alternative models does not lie in the realm of art, it lies in the realm of politics. Um, in other words, market ideology is not going to be overcome in a sort of emphatic way by art, although certainly art can contribute to it, um, to contribute to the struggle against it, rather. But in the shorter view, two models have emerged, just in my brief remarks, for turning aside the problem of the commodity, uh, the problem the commodity form produces from the, for the artwork. The first is the pre- or post-modernist solution uh, to risk the market while producing work that in some way forestalls or suspends the presupposition that is made merely uh, to be bought by someone. So this is, I think, a most, the most common mode uh, today in uh, the United States, some other national context I'm aware of. Um, it's the mode uh, that I talk about in my recent book, Autonomy, and I can speak about it at more length. Um, but again, I, what point I want to make is that it's not actually historically new. Um, it uh, arises from that moment in the middle of the 18th century where the autonomy that, is Marx, as Max pointed out, um, is wrested from the state uh, in various forms, state-like entities, by the market, um, that the market form is recognized as a threat by artists, uh, um, particularly in the sort of second half of the, of the 19th century. And those, and those sorts of solutions, um, looking very different today, but in a sort of broad sense, sort of similar solutions have arisen in the last in the in the in the postmodern period. But of course, the second solution is the modernist solution, which is to produce alternative institutional structures. Again, and Minerva was talking about some of these, but Bourdieu called them restricted fields, in which non-market judgments of various kinds uh, hold sway. But the point is that those those judgments themselves um, would be um, normatively at stake in the production of these of institutions. They would not be. Um, they would not be sort of pseudo uh, judgments produced by by the market, and of course they could be um, they could be um, in various ways subsidized by or supported by the state um, as well. It gets a little, a little complicated, um, but we're sort of familiar with that with those sort of complications. I can come back to that come back to that later. So I just want to say quickly as a way of ending that the two models are not antagonistic to each other. 
um, the artwork to produce the first solution are not are not um, super rare. It's not the norm. They're not super rare. But a time when the normative fields produced by institutional structures are everywhere in question. Again, that's another sort of uh, alibi or, or uh, alias for neoliberalism, um, leaving us ever more exposed to the judgment of the market. I hope to see uh, more artists pursuing the second um, institutional um, pathway. Thanks. Thank you. Tina. Well, thank ready? you, Nicholas. <laughs> no, I'm not ready. After Nicholas and Minerva and Max, I, I'm never ready. <laughs> Let me try something <laughs> around that. Well, and I really need to thank about this invitation, Erin Alejandra, airing that you're with emails and so uh, nice with me. And I'm very happy to be here with this three great brands together to think and talk around that, that sometimes we can uh, ask as a problem, but sometimes we can think around the situation because art and the economic system is almost the same because the structure is connected uh, as I can see, as I can understand. And uh, because the term, the terminology art is connected with this histor Eurocentric historic way of thinking and doing. And so, uh, and we are connected of a thinking around the time space that are very um, like to break itself every circle, every, every century, every time, because the situation around life and that are so broke that sometimes uh, stop the way that are doing is completely uh, necessary to keep moving and going. Um, I just, when uh, you were talking, I just uh, started to connect a little uh, time space facts. And I, I don't want to be stick by today, but I really want to back a little bit around 90s and 70s. Because I just, when Nicholas uh, said around uh, economic, I just remember Keynes, which is uh, one economist very important that uh, could understand that state, a strong state can do a strong economy. And this in 70s start to broke and uh, the way of thinking and doing an economy uh, start to broke and the stock market just start to move and the computers are starting to uh, make necessary to do the mathematics, the astronomy, and many things was uh, happening around Eurocentric world. In the same time, uh, we have. Bye, uh, love you. Bye, babe. <laughs> and in the same time in the 70s, we had in Lagos in Nigeria a huge celebration around art and communication in the world that is called Festac in 77. And at the same uh, time, in the same uh, time space, we had uh, Ukiyo Mishima doing uh, this um, suicide that is named the Seppuku, understanding that only his death could uh, start something that is uh, a guy that start uh, ways of thinking and doing in Japanese ways and dancing. And uh, these are sometimes we can think it's disconnected, but sometimes they are connected because this movement just start a little circle of a uh, little revolution in that places around art, economy, and uh, philosophy too. And uh, when I got this answer, in what ways is art determined by current economy system, we need to understand that it's not only one economy system, that don't exist only one system. And uh, in this, uh, the idea that the only money, the currency, is the way of doing and working is limited, but it's true. And not, not only true, but it's true. And we can work with that. And I like money. It's, this is not something that I don't, I really like. Maybe my next generation won't, but I, I do. And 
the but when I think what was happening in US, in Brazil, in uh, Japan, and in Nigeria, I can understand that have many ways to uh, not only ask, but to respond how you can do what you can do with these connections. And sometimes the visual ways is not the, the only ways that we can do. I, I don't think that it's something like um, casual, that art is just started to be more invisible in that time. When we trying to, to understand the performative, when we next we put something to, around the smelling thing, uh, when we do, when we start to think around technologies, when we start to think around um, music connected with art, when we start to bring together movies, uh, dance, uh, uh, many kind of perspectives. And now with the, this connection, we are starting to, to try to work hard to do the commodities as a religion. Something like we can um, understand the way of living as a commodity the way of thinking, the way of believing as a commodity. And as a commodity, we can uh, sell and buy and have. When we start to understand this uh, 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 ideas of the individualism is something that is not so good, but we need to think around collective. We start to understand too that maybe the individual is very strong and potent way of working, but only collectively we can understand how this can work. And I easy can say that this is a very Eurocentric way of, of thinking and very uh, economic and commodities way of thinking. We have another ways, understanding how to be very different, very individual, can work together to have the community, the collective working, not with equality, but understanding the differences. This is hard uh, because it's a kind of part of one uh, alternative model, but this is not a, a one alternative model that is new. We have a lot of uh, uh, technologies that made by uh, Afrocentric, nat native centric ways of doing that are connected with that. Because sometimes be equal, normal or natural is completely connected with something around the center, something around the, the, the look only one way and this, uh, this made one the strong exercise to build suburbs, to build circles around that, to build uh, uh, many ways to think around how to concentrate more and not how to spread more in a different uh, um, communications and different ways of doing and working and thinking in different languages too. So uh, have this talk now, everyone talking in English. Sometimes I know that we can lose many things because I don't uh, talk with Minerva in Spanish and Minerva don't talk with me in Portuguese. We keep some kind of secret, secrets that only in our ways of uh, um, thinking connected with our living that we can understand how to build kind of things. I really want to, to, to talk fast because I prefer to exchange more uh, and talk together uh, to understand, but I, I am completely right that one, one uh, alternative system that we can understand that uh, we need to understand that we are in limited system have limits and these limits can be 
bigger, we can uh, open these limits with another connections, with another ways of working and doing and putting in the same import, not only the same important, but putting the same uh, place to changing and deciding things as what we're gonna do with water, what we're gonna do with this money. And this is really art. You really can call this art. We have one, a very strong piece of art that now are, I think in, in Quebranly on, on France. Uh, this is a, a very, in Portuguese we say manto tupinamba. I don't know how to say manto in English. You know, Max or Minerva manto? It's like a vest. Tupinamba is it's a, a nation, indigenous nation that uh, we have here in Brazil. And uh, this uh, vest is completely full of feather. And uh, Portuguese just kidnapped that and make this uh, start to be a piece of art. Who told for Tupinambas that this was art? And uh, when I start to study art, one of the first piece of art are this vest. If this is not violent, I don't know what is that. Because people still think that what Eurocentric way of doing did with that vest was something good. And when we disconnect that, we say, well, this is good for your way of thinking. You never asked for to be done by, and you never asked for a, a lot of different ways of thinking. Maybe if we, we uh, sometimes try to understand how the limited ways that we have it's not something that we can open, but it's something that where we can stop. Sometimes we need to stop, call so many things of art, start to uh, kidnap so many things and call it art. As a creator, I can say that, that this is, can be very uh, uh, hard for me because sometimes I see many things and, and call art but sometimes call many things of art is that is not was wasn't made wasn't uh, don't have the energy to put that inside and call it art is is something that we can uh, start to doubt around that and uh, and we, and we have another uh, very invisible ways to understand art now you have this nft i don't know if you working around that NFT is something like a religious thing because you need to believe. You know, sometimes why this is not a church? Because you need to believe. You put money in that, and you have this in your computer. If you if you lose your computer or, or, or something, how you can get that? This is around religion thing. Wow, you can call this art because it's connected with the invisible. And this connection around the invisible that we get uh, as Eurocentric way of thinking in 20th century, we already had before when Marx uh, 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 says uh, uh, something around the economies in 18th century or and before 50, uh, 40th uh, century, we have this connection around this uh, religion ways of doing and thinking that are connected with art. And we're starting to, not starting, and, and we are rebuilding this connection, but not calling religion, of course, because it's not good, but we need to believe. And uh, maybe we need to believe in many different things more to uh, not, not uh, have the solution, but change the problems. And uh, I think it's, it's something around the, it's not too, too, go and run for the solution, but maybe change the problems. And uh, I think it's better open to talk together and have some questions. And I need to thank you more. Thank you. So I'm just going to jump in really quick and, um, and say uh, what I see is a couple of connections. So uh, Max, you mentioned art as a common good. And I think this is a strong way of thinking about it. Um, and um, and, and Nicholas, 
uh, I'm, I'm thinking about materialism, of course, we're, we're thinking about materialism, but I'm also thinking about a kind of down home materialism. That is like, how, how, do, how does one deal with um, an understanding about what it is to produce art in, a, in, a, in the middle of, as an art teacher, in the middle of a culture that doesn't question this at all. So, and then going to, to, to Kena, so you are absolutely right to question this term art and, and to bring up the Western centrism of it. And, and it's like, that's, that is a profoundly necessary gesture to reconsider what it means to produce art. Among other things, it seems to me that the, the insistence that art is an, is an object of value in this particular way in the market. So the freedom, going back to Max, that the market guarantees is actually very limited access to that freedom. So it's very limited um, amount of people who have access to that freedom under very limited circumstances. So I, I'm not sure that that freedom is, um, is valuable in a sort of wider way, which goes back again to the art of the common good. But thinking about art in terms of, um, the object really is a poverty. It's a poverty of thinking and it's a poverty of the potential of art thinking. And so like rather than thinking about art as an object, but art thinking as a way of analysis, it's a way of, um, of looking closely and it's an action that is shared, an action that's shared between people, but also between generations. So that way of looking at art it's not necessarily um, uh, just a product of um, thinking outside of Europe because that happened in Europe previously as well. But, um, but it's definitely a world understanding that art is, an, is a way of, of living. And that is a loss when it becomes something that is clearly uh, a product for the market. But I'll open it up from there. So anyone with a, a, a comment or thought, um, I guess we could get the chat going on the right if, if you feel shy, but otherwise, if you raise your hand, we can just call on people. And also if the panelists wanted to respond uh, in return, it's, feel free. I'll just say something just quickly while people think collecting their thoughts, just to respond to just part of what Aaron was saying um, about the last thing. Although um, it's also, I, th I, mean, I think maybe Max might want to draw out what he was saying about uh, about the sort of emergence of um, the market as a kind of freeing thing, as a historical phenomenon. I don't think he was saying that it's liberating in the present, but that's how it was. Uh, that's the sort of discursive form it took in the middle of the of the 18th century which I think is which I think is right although you know it gets very complicated and Kant preciously sort of understood that understood the market side as well as the sort of state side in his account of of aesthetic judgment but what what you were saying at the very end Aaron I thought was um, worth pointing out something I would have said if I had had more time which is that neoliberalism or or really capitalism but um, you know in its current form or the sort of market ideology market absolutism is a war on politics. It's a war against like us getting together and disagreeing about things and hashing it out uh, as a series of normative judgments. The idea is that the market can take care of all, all of these problems. They can solve um, the economic crisis, it can solve the political crisis, and so on and so forth. Um, and so it's not exactly that, you know, um, that standing on the side of art is itself a sort of revolutionary act, but it is that the sort of war on art, uh, in other words, saying that the, the sort of insistence that the work of art is a commodity and nothing else um, is actually the same. In other words, um, neoliberalism doesn't need to change faces um, to claim that, um, that the market will solve everything uh, and, that, and that works of art aren't, are, not, are not special. So in that sense, the sort of claim, the sort of strong claim um, that art uh, is not just a commodity, although of course it is in most cases um, also a commodity. Um, but the sort of the strong claim for the for the special uh, status of art as something that calls for normative judgments 
um, is on the side of politics uh, as against this. In, in, in our current moment, it has a kind of political valence um, that hasn't been, been consist consistent over time, but certainly is, I think, um, not negligible in our, in our own moment. Thank you. Jenny? Hi, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the place to do the little computer raising hand thing. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say um, thank you, everybody. I I don't know, I can't speak for anybody else, but I know that I'm trying to digest and sort of piece together this whole network of ideas. So um, it's just so many big ideas and my brain is a little bit spinning. Um, so uh, if, if there's a lag, I, I wonder if it's because of that, because we're all just kind of like, okay, now brain reordering happening here. Um, but I'm just wondering if, you know, like all of these ideas uh, create um, still a form of enclosure, right? We have, if we have the market determining art or we have institutions providing funding or even community, it creates an enclosure. And I'm just trying to, you know, because there's always gonna be a, a normative group that is determining it. And maybe that's not a problem um, because art in whatever way we understand it is a product of the environment that we are in and who we are and where we come from. Um, so it's not global, it's still local, which I think is sort of what Kano was talking about. It's like, and maybe um, I, I think it comes down to a question of if art is a way of being more than it is a commodity or it encompasses a commodity sometimes because we live in a world that where money is a thing, um, then the question really becomes one of, I mean, you know, like a universal basic income uh, so that everyone, so that art doesn't have to be conditional on any institution or it doesn't have to be conditioned on the definition of it being art, that art is a way of looking at the world, of looking deeply. I don't know. So I'm rambling. I'm going to be quiet now. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. This, this is something that is very um, specific, because it's not specific, it's something around the way of thinking. Um, and uh, yes, it's something that uh, you, you, we can be like randomic uh, thinking around how can we uh, not to break, but understand this uh, movement that we are inside. Because if it's connected with some uh, kind of violence and you're not a violent person or you don't think that you that we are, how can we be so connected with that? How can we break around that uh, ways? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, sometimes we don't need to, uh, uh, we don't need to think that we are not violent, but we need to, to think sometimes how can we, what we can do around this violence? How, knowing that it's violent what we can do around that knowing that i have because um uh, I, I know that uh, you know that i'm here in brazil and i have this uh, government that i don't need to explain more and it's very racist and sometimes people racists say to me that i need to think and thank for the the uh, slavery because without the slavery i wasn't what i am and they say i don't think i i won't think this i know that i'm i am uh, a combination of kidnapping uh, uh, robbery and a lot of violence but as my uh, Afrocentric family uh, just teach me, I know how to build life around that. I know how to understand that the pleasure is for me. It's not only around the pain and the, uh, and the suffering around that. And have a very beautiful uh, phrase uh, connected with the uh, Yoruba thinking. If you think deeply, 
everything grows in the dark. So, it, you know, like, it's very poetic, but if you work hard in, 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 the, in the life, uh, you, you can understand that it's not so poetic. Sometimes it's a very practical way of thinking too. So uh, that's when I say that, the, uh, of course, is Eurocentric uh, way of thinking. We talk about art and economy, but we are inside of a world. We are connected with this. And how can we, we assume this and, and work with, uh, with that? Ariana. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for organizing this and thank you so much for being here and speaking thinking with us. Um, a question that comes up for me is, Nicholas, you mentioned the fact that um, the place for affecting change on the neoliberal system as a whole isn't in art, it's in politics, but um, I guess I still think that part of art is politics, that that art, to some extent, can do politics. And so that art is one of the places where we can do politics to change the economic and political system. And I guess I was just wondering whether you all believe that, or like, what is the realm that counts as politics to you? Thank you. Minerva? Um, well, yeah, I, I would say that personally, uh, I'm always uh, questioning if my production, uh, all kinds, either uh, publications or artworks are culturally relevant, not if they are successful in any other way, but if they contribute um, to culture. And um, well, I also ended up uh, wondering if, if we have the need to re rename art, if it's a problem within language, if we would need to rename it, because I think we all um, appreciate also um, the creative ways or uh, aesthetics that could be part of uh, many cultures and many communities, and those are really valuable. And uh, I don't know, in my case, I don't have a problem to uh, perceive it as art, um, but uh, I wouldn't have a problem renaming it either. So I don't know if, if it's a, a question of art or just uh, paying attention to our priorities uh, in every single thing we do. And, and of course that connects to, to art as a way of living, uh, which for me, it's, it's uh, very much like that. No, I, I cannot separate my personal politics with my creative process or uh, what I support or what kind of... Um, the, the toy again. I'll, I'll, uh, get that peak at some point. Um, so uh, well, I'll stop here. <laughs> I'll get the toy. Thank you. Max or Nicholas, did you have a feeling about the Ariana's question? Yeah, no, I, I do. I was waiting for other people to speak up. I mean, um, so first of all, I mean, it, it's clearly the case, you know, on the one hand, um, that art can contribute discursively to political uh, movements and formations. Um, I think that's sort of uncontroversial. Um, but what I was what I was saying instead was that you know art doesn't have any levers of its own. In other words, it it doesn't like in other words a union can stop work. It can actually produce um, change in a in a situation without changing anyone's mind. Uh, whereas art can only uh, work through people's minds. It only works through judgment and, and the sort of things that art, leaving that term up for the moment, uh, has traditionally done. And that, you know, that those don't have power in the same way that unions and, and other sorts of, and, and state power and, and, and all kinds of other formations do have. But, it's, it's, but, but also I was trying to say that there is a politics of taking seri art seriously, which I was trying to respond quickly to, uh, uh, um, to Aaron. And just so that I don't re return too many times to the to the podium, um, just responding quickly to Jenny's question, so that was an excellent question. Um, 
that I just wanted, would want to distinguish between um, enclosure on the one hand and normativity on the other. They look the same, but they're not the same. Historically, but also when we use enclosure, um, it means um, keeping people out of the means of production. That can be, we can understand that very broadly, um, but in other words, depriving them of the means of subsistence, or sub, in other words, lock, it's a kind of lockout. Whereas a normative field is not a lockout. In other words, um, you know, there is in some sense a price of admission, um, but that does not have to be out of anyone's reach. In other words, uh, a normative field can be mastered by anyone. Um, the whole sort of the, the whole um, uh, point of having a, a field governed by rules, the way we all do, being in institutions, we're all in an institution right now. Um, is that you know the rules uh, are sort of masterable by, by anyone, which is not to say that there aren't empirically you know barriers to entry, but those barriers to entry don't have to do with normativity as such. They have to do with enclosure. In other words, they have to do with capitalism. Um, in other words, uh, the fact that people get together and form institutions or para-institutional sort of formations um, that agree on rules that count for them as um, the rules that help us decide what's good or bad or true or false, um, I would want to dis distinguish that from, uh, from uh, enclosure, which is an entirely different and sort of intrinsically violent phenomenon. Um, I, I wanted to say something also about the, the, the violence. Uh, Nicholas just mentioned uh, uh, Keina and uh, mentioned before, I think that this question also Minerva and Keina, I think we're going, uh, I felt into a similar direction by thinking like we need to rethink our notion of art, right? And as Keina has pointed out, um, just the, the limitation of, of the Western gaze and, and understanding uh, and conception of art um, is violent by taking things and uh, um, calling them art. Uh, I'm not sure if, if that's also something that the, the, the normative judgments uh, um, have to do with that Nicholas mentioned, but um, I think that the, the, the very constitution of the idea of the artwork in, in, in Western society is an act of violence against uh, other forms of, of uh, living and producing, right? So um, uh, I think it, it's very interesting visiting uh, ethnographic collections or anthropological museums and seeing what things are being called uh, artworks. Like Kena mentioned the, the Kappa Manta uh, Tupi, uh, Tupinamba, and, and I think that um, uh, I was in, in an ethnological museum in Cologne recently where, where there was this, um, it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a storage, storage. A, yes, a storage box or so of an Indonesian a warehouse. Okay, yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a kind of a warehouse, a chamber, like wooden thing with a roof. It's quite big and it's a storage place for rice uh, that was built on water and it was uh, somewhere from the Indonesian context. And uh, this, this box, this uh, warehouse was extremely beautiful, right? It had a lot of decorations and stuff. So the Western understanding of art, uh, then even in a, a let's say decolonial note or so that this museum is really hard, you know, trying to to have a decolonial um, reading and interpretation of these things or so. Still, um, what they do is they take this wooden box and put it there, and the limitation of their ideas um, is to say this is the artwork, right? So, and they kind of celebrate themselves by saying, you know, this is artwork. So we, we respect it as artwork thinking that um, it would be a respectful thing to call whatever thing that is appealing to the eye um, or has a lot of details and decoration would be art. But then um, again, I think uh, that we need to understand that the, the process of which this, this warehouse wooden object uh, 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 
is part of is way much larger than the production of the wooden object right so if it's a if it's a storage for rice um we and if we see how beautiful because this is i will just say it like this it is like unbelievably unbelievably beautiful right so um if we see that the place where they store the rice uh, in between harvesting and eating it or processing it and eating it or, or you know, harvesting and before processing it. However, I don't know when, where in the chain of you know, uh, actions um, uh, this, this warehouse comes into play. But it's so unbelievably uh, beautiful that the Western eye says, this is the, the, the work of art part of this whole chain of, let's say, a, a living process of a community. And I say, you know, if the place they, they store it in between harvesting and processing or cooking it um, is already that beautiful. Imagine as how incredibly beautiful the sowing and the harvesting must be understood for this culture, right? But it doesn't find a... a, a a material, let's say, uh, a, a manifestation, but it is obvious that if they put so much effort into constructing just the 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 place, el embase, uh, the, the, the 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 wrapping of the corn, right? Um, imagine how valuable and beautiful must for this culture must be the. You know, putting the seeds in the ground and, and seeing uh, everything grow and harvesting it to share it with the community. So labor actually, in a, in a Western term or so, collective labor and the providing for uh, the community is something that I believe is uh, uh, probably much more cherished and much more beautiful, considered much more beautiful than this wooden box that we have uh, in the in the museum and we can only kind of try to compare if the storage place is that beautiful how incredibly more beautiful must be the processes of communal life that are before and after the box so to speak and um, so our idea of what art is i think needs to be uh, really re uh, rethought and we need to understand uh, that cutting any sort of organic process of an operative chain of a communal process involved with nature, involved with um, the, the cycles of agriculture and of ancestral knowledge and, and the cosmos, um, we have to understand that cutting this organic um, uh, cosmic uh, um, uh, relation and cutting out one wooden box and declaring it a, a work of art is exactly, I think, the violence that Kena was talking about. So we, we would really need to, um, to rethink uh, the limits of our notion of art. And I think uh, we're probably in a good historical moment um, to do so, since um, many of, of the historic uh, uh, things that are happening to us are um, pointing towards uh, rethinking ourselves and our relation to things, be it uh, the, the vast uh, digitalization that we're living through this COVID crisis, you know, um, or be it uh, the, the anti-racist and anti-colonial uh, and anti-patriarchal claims that we're seeing from so social movements, bringing them to the street and having, as a matter of fact, an impact on established Western institutions. So it's a good moment to ask ourselves what our notion of art actually is. Thanks, Max. Thank you. Seems to me like part of the problem is of naming, which of course is not as easy as just saying this is the name, but it implies that art has been colonized and art language has been colonized. Uh, and then, uh, you know, terms such as freedom that we have discussed here, or like even what art is, or what in, an institution is. Um, 
then we are rethinking all of this. So we either have to find new words that we're proposing here, or maybe we have to find a new activity that does what we think art should do, but art does not do. So we are either in a problem of naming or in a problem of escaping. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, maybe uh, we will not have the solution, as I said before, but we maybe change the, the problem. Some new problems is better than the solution sometimes. And uh, uh, about the uh, art and politics that are connected or disconnected for me, the, the idea to split these positions are, are something that is very, um, built by this structure that we have because uh, when we uh, because I did philosophy in university and the ethic and the static are completely connected disconnect this is uh, uh, was a constructor that made us think this we uh, have this uh, idea that the body are completely cut it like mind and brain and the heart and feeling and digestion and the, uh, what you eat is not connected what, with your humor that is not connected with what you do is not connected with it in your age it's something like if you cut with so many ways what we do in our life when we do art something art and something politic art feminist art, racialized art, and not just art, is for me, it's, it's just a, um, a movement that uh, um, the structure made us to think that it's truth. But it's impossible to understand the art disconnected with the time space. And, uh, and uh, impossible to understand that you can do something disconnected with the uh, your your way of doing and thinking even if you don't believe in the same thing we are connected by time space so i think ethic and aesthetic is 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 the same movement it's like breath in and breath out it's like to take out the death of our life how can we take out the death is this is a movement that our uh, 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 intelligent, uh, Western intelligent do with us. We take out the death in our life. You put bad things around this, and but we are completely connected. So ethic and static, breath in, breath out, life, that is something that if you can understand that are the same, we can uh, change the problems <laughs> sometimes. Well, the example that Max gave uh, made me I think that uh, maybe every culture uh, recognizes the power of um, beauty. And there are so many different uh, conceptions of beauty at the end. Um, and that, that, that kind of decoration, because uh, we call it like that, linked to agricultural processes, or you know, in the case of the uh, Mayans, for example, to decorate with monkeys the pots for chocolate had to do with the mythology attached to all these um, uh, things. But uh, at the end, it's, uh, it's something powerful, not? And, and if they recognize that uh, an aesthetic process or aesthetic element is powerful, I think that's uh, also something that we shouldn't um, lose, no, it's it's um, also in our hands to use all the uh, practices that have to do with uh, creative processes to uh, generate positive change. And that's uh, also how I sometimes um, describe the difference between uh, the artistic practice that sometimes is linked to uh, social issues uh, with activism. Because I think uh, in the field of art, at the end, activism um, has a very uh, clear uh, objective and can be measured. You know, all the results uh, 
of a very specific action can be measured. And in the field of art, even though we can generate change, um, we also have the freedom to be outside these uh, measurements. Uh, and well, it's, it's just part of, of our practice. Are there any last thoughts or comments? I had just one uh, comment, quick comment. Okay. I wanted to, um, well, thank you all very much. It was like Jenny said, it takes a while to process everything, but um, the, the piece that I really relate to and, and really concerns me is the overriding dogma of theology and how it set the uh, human species above all others and how that um, forced a whole kind of culture of using and abusing instead of protecting and serving. And I think art both plays into that on many levels, but I wonder how we change that culture when theology is such a strong political, social, justifying influence on everything that people do, especially the Judeo-Christian, unlike Shintoism, which is really nature driven. And um, I, just, I just question how we move forward with that. It's hard to answer that. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk. <laughs> well, then. <laughs> well, slowly. Yeah. yeah. Slowly, yes. Yes. It's a process. But we don't have a lot of time. I mean, I guess it's nice to think about the, the long term. Um, I mean, it, as an individual, it's it's impossible somehow to imagine that. But we we have to hope that at some point the human species will not be as horrible as it is currently. Yes, I agree, <laughs> and I believe that. And I guess as parents, I think kids do give us hope that they are more aware of their place in the world than we were, I believe. Yeah, we have to have hope, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we call it an evening and uh, Everyone, thank you so much, um, all the panelists who have agreed to come and be with us. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to have you and great for these thoughts. And uh, I guess it would be fantastic if we could go have some beers together and continue, <laughs> maybe another time, uh, hopefully. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for thank you so much. participating and talking. And, um, yeah. Um, and we'll see most of you later. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. It was wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thank bye. Michael, Minerva, and Max. Bye, bye bye. See you all bye, soon. Bye. See you soon. Hope to see you soon. Hasta pronto.